Hey everybody, uh, in this video I wanted to talk to you about something that I think is really a critical step in starting to really take charge of the performance in your applications and that is understanding the browser rendering process. So what I'm talking about here is uh, the process that basically happens to take what your code is, what you've written, uh, to displaying that on the screen and changing what the users see over time. And the process is actually quite similar to uh, just a regular uh, film, for example. This video that I'm recording right now follows a very similar process. And so a movie is basically just a bunch of still images uh, placed side by side and just played really quickly. And there's a point at which if we take just individual still frames with minor variations and we just display them quickly on the screen, there's a point at which we stop sort of perceiving them as being just these still pictures and as a fluid moving uh, thing. And our browser follows uh, the same process. So we have something on screen. If we have our application, we just have a still a static image of our application. And then if we do anything to change that, then what we see on screen changes. Even if we have things like animations and things moving across the screen, ultimately it's still just a bunch of still images that are being displayed. Uh, they're projected onto the screen and then we see those. And as long as those uh, images are changing fast enough, it looks to be fluid and it looks to us as though something is moving on the screen. And so the point at which that happens is around 60 frames per second. If we can, uh, if we can change the image that the user is seeing on screen about 60 times per second, the user is going to perceive whatever is happening on the screen at any point in time as just a fluid motion uh, rather than a series of individual frames. Now the problem with performance is that there's work that needs to be done to get that still frame displayed on the screen. Uh, and so something will happen to change uh, your application. You might just be changing a color, the screen might be scrolling down, you might be animating something. Uh, something will trigger some kind of change. And then the browser needs to go through some kind of process to calculate what's changing and then display that on the screen. Now the more complex uh, that the work is, it needs to be done to perform that change the harder it's going to be to uh, get to that 60 frames per second point. And if we can't get to that 60 frames per second, that's when things start to look choppy and laggy and they just don't look good. So in this video, what I want to do is just go through uh, and give a high level overview uh, of that process because I think understanding what's, uh, what's happening and what triggers certain steps in that process and what can cause things to slow down can really uh, start to help you design better applications. Okay, so let's talk through this uh, browser rendering process in a little bit more detail now. Uh, so there's this excellent article here by Paul Lewis and it just uh, gives a really good overview of the browser rendering process. Uh, I'll link to that in the description and um, it would definitely be a good idea to give that a read. Uh, but the reason that I'm on here now is to take a look at this little uh, picture here, which is a really good way to visualize what is happening uh, throughout the browser rendering process. Now, when it comes to optimizing this, it is a bit of a rabbit hole, I guess. And the more you understand about the rendering process and about the underlying browser engines, uh, the better you're going to be able to optimize your code. And there's really a lot that you could learn about all this stuff, uh, but it's also something where you can benefit from just a little bit of knowledge. I'm certainly an expert in uh, browser engines and optimizing code, but I think with a few key understandings, you can really uh, improve the performance of your code. So I mentioned the process that the browser goes through to render the well, what you see on screen. And so each frame is calculated by what you see on screen now, this JavaScript style layout paint composite. And so the basic idea is that some change uh, is triggered either through JavaScript or CSS. And once that, and once that code runs that triggers that change, then we go to the style step in this process where uh, the browser needs to calculate what styles to apply to all of the elements on your page based on your uh, CSS selectors that you have set up. After that, it'll proceed to the layout stage where uh, the position of everything on the screen is calculated. The paint stage will actually paint those pixels on the screen so the user can see it. And the composite step will organize layers uh, since uh, different parts of the layout can be painted onto different layers that can then be organized, uh, either having some layers in front of the others or being moved around. So that's the, the full process to uh, generate a frame. 
And as I mentioned, you need to get to 60 frames per second to get that smooth experience. So if your code is triggering lots of changes, it needs to be able to get through this whole process uh, as many times as required, uh, but still be able to get 60 frames to the screen per second. Uh, but it's not always necessary to go through this uh, entire process. If you take a look at uh, some of these other pictures here, you can see that in this case, uh, certain changes will allow you to skip the layout step, which is often the most uh, expensive step to perform. And with some, uh, with some changes, you can even avoid the paint step as well as the layout step. So let's just talk about each of these steps in a little bit more detail. Uh, obviously there's a lot of things to learn about each step and uh, there's plenty of ways to optimize, but we're just gonna cover it at a really high level uh, just to get a basic understanding of what's happening and you know, what maybe we can do to affect that. So with the first step with changes, uh, running JavaScript code that's gonna trigger some change on the screen. Uh, obviously if we can avoid it, we shouldn't trigger changes. Uh, if you don't need to be changing things on the screen, don't do it, or if you do need to do it, you wanna do it in the most efficient way possible the less times we need to go through this uh, process of calculating everything, the better. And one important thing to keep in mind is that it's better to trigger these changes uh, at the beginning of this process rather than say, uh, making your way through a frame and then triggering another change. And you can run into this situation called uh, layout thrashing, which I'll link to an article about that for more information. But basically you're creating a situation where you're just uh, constantly having to calculate the layout uh, in a way that's just not very efficient. And something called request animation frame is a good way to organize uh, the, the changes you're making to your uh, application to ensure you're not running into this problem of, of layout thrashing and causing these unnecessary frames. Uh, but in the case of an Ionic application, uh, this is where the DOM controller comes in handy. Uh, it's a, a class that the uh, Ionic framework provides. And basically you can just perform any changes you're making say to a DOM element uh, and you can even do this with reads as well. Uh, you can just perform those changes inside of a call to the write method on the DOM controller. And what that's going to do is organize the writes and execute them at uh, an appropriate time. Uh, so rather than just immediately triggering a change, it is going to let the DOM controller decide when to trigger that change so that it is more efficient in calculating the layout. And it's also going to coordinate your changes with any that uh, Ionic is making as well. So you should be able to get significantly, uh, significantly improved performance by using the DOM controller over just uh, triggering changes whenever you want to. And so for the next step, the style calculations. Uh, so basically we'll just have our, all our CSS selectors, all of the rules that we have. Uh, we might have uh, some style set up for paragraph tags. Maybe we want, we want to make the text color red for those. Maybe we have some class selectors that are applying different heights and widths and whatever other styles we want. Uh, so the browser needs to go through all those styles, figure out which ones to apply to each element. Uh, some styles might override other styles, so that needs to be calculated. And for most people, there's not, there's probably not huge performance gains uh, to be had here, depending on the complexity of your CSS, I guess. But just in general, the less complex your CSS rules are, uh, the better in this stage. And the next step is usually the most uh, expensive step in this whole process, and that's the calculation of the layout. And so basically what the browser needs to do here is to figure out where everything sits on the screen. And so in the previous style step, uh, the browser would have calculated what styles to apply to uh, everything. And so in the layout step, uh, the browser would know that, okay, so this, this box needs to be 20 pixels under this one. So it puts that on the screen and then sort of all the rest of the elements are flowing on the screen, sitting next to uh, other elements in relation to another element and basically just the whole layout of the screen needs to be calculated. And so if you're making a change that say, maybe you're adding a margin to something or you're changing the height of something, changing the height of one element could impact the position of another element on the screen. So if I had a, um, say this, I changed the height of this box over here that says overview. If I make that hundred pixels tall, that's going to push this, uh, all these other boxes down as well. So they all need to be calculated and the browser needs to figure out where to display those on the screen now. And so that's something that it's really a good idea to avoid wherever possible is to not uh, be making lots of these, uh, these changes that are going to need, uh, that's going to require the browser to recalculate the layout on the page. 
And although that's, I guess, an obvious one where you know, you're changing the height of something, obviously that's moving the positions of other elements, uh, but you can also trigger layouts by uh, even just checking the value of something. So in JavaScript, if you were to try and check the height of a particular element, uh, if you trigger that at the, the wrong point in time, you could force the entire frame to be uh, recalculated or the entire layout to be recalculated because if you're requesting a particular height value, for example, well, the browser needs to know the value for that and that it may need to calculate that. And so this is another situation where the DOM controller comes in handy uh, because you can um, trigger a read for a particular uh, DOM element from within the DOM controller. And that is going to make sure you don't run into that situation where the values need to be recalculated before you can get access to that value. Okay, so then we have the, uh, the paint step, which is uh, just putting the pixels on the screen. So on the previous step, uh, the browser calculates where everything should be. And then the paint step, we actually paint that on the screen. Uh, font colors are applied, background colors. Uh, pretty much everything that you see is painted onto the screen at this point. And so some things that are painted will require more uh, power and performance than others. Uh, box shadows, for example, uh, can be something that slows down your application a bit in some cases. And it's also important to understand that uh, the entire screen isn't always painted. Sometimes an operation will require that the whole page is repainted, uh, but sometimes you only need to repaint a portion of the screen or a particular rectangle on the screen. And you can actually see this uh, if you go into the debugging tools. I've got, I've got an application here uh, that I created for another tutorial. And it's just a little achievement overlay thing. And so obviously things are happening on the screen here. So it's going to require some paint operations. So if I just open up the, uh, the rendering uh, tab here, and if you tick this paint flashing box, it says highlights areas of the page that need to be repainted. Uh, so if I click this again now, you can see uh, these green boxes jumping around showing what the browser is actually painting at that time. And you can see in some cases, it's just painting a small rectangle and we also have a larger green rectangle popping up at some point as well. And again, so with the paint step, it's not as bad usually as the layout step, but wherever possible, if we can avoid uh, triggering paints and triggering uh, having to paint the entire screen, that's going to be beneficial for performance. And finally, we have the composite step. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we can paint different parts of the screen onto different layers. And if you're familiar with using tools like uh, Photoshop, it could really help to understand uh, what that means. Uh, so if you paint things onto different layers, you can then just easily move those layers around in relation to each other. Uh, you could put different layers on top of another one. Uh, so think if we're changing the Z index, we might want one particular thing to sit on top of something else. And so we can arrange those layers to reflect how we want that to look. Uh, but it's also cheaper to move these layers around and we can even decrease the opacity of the layers without having to uh, recalculate everything. If we just want to move an individual layer, we can move that without affecting anything else on the screen. And so that's why things like uh, using the transform property to move things around is a good idea. So unlike something like a height or a margin, which is going to impact other elements on the screen, if we're just using a transform, we're just kind of moving that layer around. So we don't need to recalculate every other element on the screen, we're just moving that layer and nothing else is impacted. And same with opacity changes, if we're just uh, reducing the opacity of something or increasing the opacity of a layer, we can just do that without having to recalculate and repaint uh, everything else on the screen. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind the browser rendering process. Uh, it is a good idea to understand this as best you can uh, if you're looking to optimize the performance in your application. Uh, in general, you want to avoid having to calculate frames wherever possible. Uh, if you do need to be calculating frames, try to avoid the layout and paint steps as much as you can, uh, especially try to avoid the layout step uh, as much as you can. Uh, but of course, sometimes that is required. So I'll link to a couple more resources down in the description. I have an article about uh, the DOM controller and layout thrashing that goes into a bit more depth. And I'll also link to my Elite Ionic course, which uh, covers a lot of performance concepts in, in a lot of depth. Uh, we go through stuff like this and we also go through uh, debugging performance and, and seeing where these uh, processes are being triggered using the debugging tools. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, you might want to check that out.
Okay, so thanks for watching this uh, video and I will see you in the next one.